Hi there, we're here today with our friend, Dr. James Doty, and uh, kind of doing a wisdom profile to find out more about his great work. And uh, so, Dr. Doty, tell us who you are, you know, and, you know, what you do. Well, let's start with who you are. How would you define that, who you are? Well, hopefully, um, I would like to be perceived as a caring, kind human being. So if that can be the starting point, um, that's who I am, hopefully. That being said, in a more traditional sense, um, I'm a, a neurosurgeon on the faculty at Stanford University School of Medicine, and I'm the founder and director of the Center for Compassion and Altruism Research and Education which is part of the School of Medicine, whose mission is to understand the neural social basis of compassion. And uh, the Dalai Lama is actually the founding benefactor. Um, and I've also been blessed to be the chairman of the Dalai Lama Foundation for several years. And um, while I am a non-believer, if you will, or an atheist, uh, I'm also uh, have been a senior advisor to the Council of the Parliament of World Religions. And interestingly enough, uh, I have been blessed as well to have uh, relationships with many of the religious and spiritual living icons in the world. And uh, the interesting thing is that people will say, how is it possible if you're an atheist or a scientist to have these relationships. And what I always tell people is the nature of the work that I do, which if you will, is to scientifically, excuse me, demonstrate the value proposition of compassion in regard to mental and physical health, actually aligns with what many spiritual and religious uh, um, teachings have uh, evolved which uh, at the basis of essentially everyone is the importance of compassion to live a life and a meaningful life. And so on some level, you may say it seems strange, but on the other, uh, it makes perfect sense because oftentimes the actions that we have evolved to do as human beings relate to our evolution and the science of how our physiology and brain developed. Um, so in addition to those aspects of my background, uh, I have also been an entrepreneur, have been um, involved with a variety of uh, startups, one of which went public for $1.2 billion. Uh, I was the CEO of that for a period of time. And then I've also, um, been involved in areas of venture capital and entrepreneurship. But probably the most important part of my story, which is germane here to why I'm talking with you, relates to what is a the truth for all of us is that who we are today is a manifestation of our past. And for myself, uh, I grew up in a challenging background with a father who was an alcoholic, a mother who had had a stroke when she was young, when I was young, and she was partially paralyzed, had a seizure disorder, and um, sadly was chronically depressed, attempted suicide numerous times, and neither of my parents had gone to college. Uh, in fact, we were on public assistance my entire life. And uh, as a result of that situation, and we now know there's something uh, that has been researched and is called adverse childhood experiences, people will children who grow up in environments of poverty, uh, mental and uh, um, health uh, issues, uh, drugs and alcohol abuse, uh, violence, um, et cetera, the likelihood of them recovering or being contributing members of society, of society diminishes and profoundly. In fact, actually very few people get out of those environments. And one of the characteristics of those people who do get out oftentimes has to do with a seminal event or a seminal person, uh, which changed their worldview. 
and at the time, as a child who was 12, I uh, had despair, anxiety, fear, probably what's now recognized as post-traumatic stress disorder from this chaotic uh, environment. Um, but at the age of 12, I walked into a magic shop and the owner wasn't there, but his mother was there. And I described this woman as an earth mother type. She had a radiant smile. And uh, we were talking about um, judgment in the past uh, here. Uh, you know, when you come from either a minority background or one of poverty, uh, oftentimes you're judged and you carry this judgment uh, around. And, and this woman was non judgmental. Uh, she had this incredible smile and an accepting smile. And what happened was um, her and I began talking. I went in there actually to look at magic tricks, but it turned out she knew nothing about the magic. She was the owner's mother. And she was just there while he was doing an errand. But uh, at the end of about 20 or 30 minutes of conversation with this woman, um, she looked at me and, sh and she'd asked me some really penetrating questions. She made me feel comfortable. And... Uh, after 20 or 30 minutes, she said, you know, I really like you. I'm here for another six weeks. If you show up every day, I uh, think I could teach you something that could change your life. And during that six week period where I showed up between one to two hours every day, she taught me a meditation practice, uh, which, and remember this was in 1968. We didn't talk about mindfulness or um uh, meditation. Uh, we didn't even discuss neuroplasticity. We didn't believe it. Existed. Didn't, no, 12 year old, you weren't, that wasn't on the uh, topic of discussion? Well, even in the neuroscience world, it, it, it was thought that the brain was immutable and could not uh, uh, regenerate or you could not sort of change your neural pathways. And so it was uh, interesting because clearly, uh, based on some experience this woman had, she understood intuitively that you could. And um, the reality for many of us is that <clears throat> we have this constant level of stress. We were talking about living in a digital age and practicing compassion. You know, we don't appreciate it, but many of us uh, are, uh, are stressed, anxious, depressed. In fact, there's an epidemic in the United States. One in four people will tell you that uh, when they're sad, lonely, suffering, they do not have a single person they feel comfortable talking with. So it's horrible, you know, uh, over 20% of people, adults are on some sort of mood altering medication. Um, so there is a crisis and what had the crisis is a manifestation of stimulation of this part of our autonomic nervous system called our, uh, stress response or our, um, sympathetic nervous system. And, that gets engaged and you're anxious all the time and you're scared. So uh, that was the case with me. Um, so we began with this uh, woman and, uh, and she taught me how to relax my body, how to breathe. And just those actions in and of themselves shifted me from the stress mode and engagement of my sympathetic nervous system to the rest and digest mode, which is called our parasympathetic nervous system. And as soon as you're in that mode, Essentially, every aspect of your physiology improves. And from there, she taught me that I beat myself up a lot. I had created a narrative that I would repeat to myself about how I wasn't smart enough, I wasn't good enough, et cetera, et cetera. And I thought that narrative was me. I thought that what I was saying was me saying it. And the fact of the matter was that it was a false narrative that had been created, and I had accepted it for truth, and it wasn't truth at all. And uh, so she allowed me to recognize this. And once I recognized it, she helped me change the narrative. And this is uh, this practice of going into this meditative, meditative state and not having an emotional response to this, this negative dialogue is, again, uh, very commonly practiced in mindfulness-based stress reduction. But the other aspect, though, that was critically important that is not explicitly done in those practices is that she taught me how to change the dialogue to be kind and compassionate and self-compassionate uh, <clears throat> so that I changed the narrative to one of self-acceptance, one of deserving of love, et cetera. And it was from that that then she taught me 
then that everyone is suffering, that I wasn't the only one suffering, and that um, by reaching out and actually caring for others to being of service actually benefited me and my own physiology. And then the most powerful aspect from there was she taught me this uh, technique, which is now used uh, in uh, sports psychology, they call it visualization, but this was a technique to define an a intention or goal, and then through repetition um, and sort of seeing it occur in my mind, which primes your subconscious, uh, it allowed me to be able to manifest uh, my own dreams and aspirations. And um, that period of time with that woman changed the trajectory of my life. And that's what I talk about in my book, Into the Magic Shop, uh, Neurosurgeon's Quest to Discover the Mysteries of the Brain and the Secrets of the Heart, um, which as you know, uh, was a New York Times bestseller, is now in 40 languages and it has received a number of awards. Um, so uh, basically that's my background, if you will. Right, right, right. And uh, so I find it, you know, fascinating that it adds a whole other level is like where you're doing this. You're not doing it on an ashram. You're not doing it um, in the middle of Manhattan. You're doing it at a, Stanford University is your center, and that's how many students are, are in that school? Oh wow! I, it's not uh, actually that big of a university. It's I, I think it's only twelve thousand, sixteen thousand, something like that. It's uh, and actually uh, Stanford, uh, obviously, as you know, uh, has a wonderful reputation, and it probably has one of the largest endowments per number of students of any university in the world. Uh, it certainly um, stands with Harvard and Yale and a number of uh, the Ivy League schools. Uh, and a lot of extraordinary research is coming from there. And that's why having a center like this at Stanford uh, immediately gave credibility uh, to the nature of this work. Because there is an assumption that if someone at Stanford is doing this work, uh, it's real. And I have to say that while I would like to believe it was a reflection of my own wonderful reputation uh, that uh, resulted in this uh, increase in interest in the field of compassion, uh, really it has to do with the fact that the work that I do, the center, is at Stanford. Right. It's, uh, it gives credence to it. And, you know, being, you know, one of the things on this podcast, we call it street smart wisdom and, uh, you know, trying to bring ancient ideas or esoteric ideas down to street level. I think it's a different, it's not, it's not the streets of Manhattan or Brooklyn, but it, the science of this functions to make it real to, to people. Uh, I think, because it, it uh, you know, intuitively, you know that if you're a good person, you'll be more relaxed. Or if you're a more compassionate person, you're more open-hearted and you model that in the world, people are nicer to you. Instinctually, okay, the world's a better place. Okay, peace, love, and all that good stuff. But when it gets down to hardcore science, uh, I think that, that that's a kind of a game changer to me, because i when I was 12, I had my own rite of passage and challenges, and I've been on this path for 159 years. And, um, and when I hear the uh, telomeres or this, you know, oxytocin, and you're more compassionate, you, uh, your body actually changes, that kind of validates what, I, what I've known intuitively, like my, my whole life. So I love the science of all this woo-woo stuff. Is it, and it may, takes the woo-woo out of it, I think. Or it strengthens the woo-woo. It just depends on uh, how you look at it, of course. But uh, um, no, I think uh, that's true. Um, and I think uh, if you look at my own personal story and background and trajectory, and uh, that, Combined with the center, it sort of also um, makes it a more interesting story, frankly. 
Um, and uh, I've been blessed because I've gotten to be the face of some of this and allowed me to do, you know, so many other things uh, that I wouldn't have been allowed and opened uh, sort of a, a, a path that probably at the age of 12, uh, I would say I could not have uh, fathomed. Um, getting back to the center, if you look at the work that we do, which uh, is typically collaborative with scientists, both at Stanford as well as all over the world. Uh, and we utilize a variety of techniques, whether they're behavioral, um, uh, utilizing functional magnetic resonance imaging, whether they're physiologic measures. We do a variety of those studies, but as part of what the center does, we also uh, have lecture series where we bring the leading scientists to Stanford to talk about their work. We hold conferences. Uh, we've had conferences as an example on compassion and business, uh, compassion and healthcare, and, uh, and just the science of compassion. And then uh, I have a series which I call Conversations on Compassion. And to me, this is actually one of the funnest things that I do because um, I get to sit on the stage with somebody I think is interesting, who's led a life, if you will, of compassion, and then talk to them for about an hour and a half or so about their lives and uh, the importance of compassion in what they do. And we've had Thich Nhat Hanh, Eckhart Tolle, Warner Earhart, the Dalai Lama, Sri Sri Ravi Shankar, Sadhguru, Amma, the hugging uh, saint, and uh, as well as scientists and uh, actors, actresses, business people. And it's been an extraordinary group of conversations because again, essentially every one of these people emphasizes uh, through their own example and their own lives, how compassion has profoundly impacted them, those around them and the world. Uh, how can people find out more about your work? Uh, you can go to the CCARE website, which is uh, www.ccare.stanford.edu. And there's also one for the book called Into the Magic Shop, Dot com. And so at either of those places, you can find a lot of information about our research and, uh, and there's really a plethora of um, YouTube videos uh, about uh, the conferences we've had, the talks, the conversations on compassion, and so uh, a lot of material. Excellent. That, so that's, that's great to know. And your book is Into the Magic Shop, which is a great read. I recommend it highly. And uh, anything else before we say goodbye? I think we've covered most things. All right. Excellent. All right, uh, Dr. James Doty, thanks so much for your time. It was a pleasure talking with you. Thank you. And it's always good to see you. Absolutely. See you and hear you. Okay. Yeah.